As promised, I'm taking you guys to the top of the mountain. You're going to see beautiful views along this entire video. We got Mount Tam in the background. My beautiful wife Lizzie here Hi joining <laughs> on the walk. You get to feast your eyes on all this while we talk about all this crazy stuff. And today, I'm just going to do like a bunch of random stories, guys. Like I did this a few months ago and it turned out pretty good. And sometimes I just need to go over things that I think are interesting. So this video might not have a lot of rhyme or reason to it or a lot of like flowing from one story to the next, but there's a lot of things that are important in here that I want to cover. But we are going to start with some real estate stuff because right now, location, location, location is no longer the priority for many different home buyers. And that has been the time-tested rule of thumb of where and when you should buy a property because that seems to be the thing that determines the value of a property the most and it still does today if you ask me however today's home buyers are not able to focus on location 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 anymore because affordability is impeding that in fact in a recent survey 36 percent of home buyers said that the most important factor when selecting a new home is affordability right now and 33% said it was the neighborhood. So you still have a lot of people who are concerned about the location, but even more people now are concerned about the affordability. Now, look how much things have changed because the last time Fannie Mae surveyed people and asked about this, okay, in 2014, 20% 20 of people said affordability was the biggest priority and 49% said the neighborhood. So this dynamic has shifted dramatically since then. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing because on the one hand i think it's smart for people that can't afford where they live to find somewhere else to live guys and basically you know go where your money is treated best you know go to a place where you can afford a nice house but not at the expense of you know living in a bad neighborhood or potentially putting yourself or your family into danger or buying in a dying area where businesses are closing and that's why everything is uh, getting cheaper. You know, San Francisco across the bay is a great example of that. And also part of this trend could be due to remote work because remote work has had a significant impact on areas that used to be affordable that no longer are and is pushing people that used to be able to afford that neighborhood to look in other areas. And there's just so many issues with all of it that I think people need to really start paying attention to what really is important, guys, because obviously affordability is number one. If you can't afford the house, you can't afford it. But you shouldn't sacrifice affordability at the expense of having everything else you don't like. You know, if the location's no good, you actually don't like the house itself, you actually uh, don't have, they don't have good schools for your children, different things like that need to be looked at, not just affordability. So it needs to have some sort of combination of all of it for it to really make sense as a purchase. See, when I promised I'd take you guys up here, we were over there on Belvedere Island. It looks so tiny from up here. And uh, you got Sausalito in the background. You got the Golden Gate Bridge over there. You got San Francisco across the bay. The views up here are just stunning. I love climbing these mountains and uh, I'm definitely gonna do some more of these mountain videos for you. Now here's another real estate story that basically confirms what I just said. And that is that if you want to buy a house in 2023, you basically need to have a combined or individual income in the six figure range right now to be able to afford a median price home at today's prices and interest rates, which is insane because we know most households do not have six figure incomes. According to the most recent data, in order to be able to buy a home in the United States right now in an average market, you need to earn about $105,000 per year as a household income to even qualify and to be able to afford it which is crazy guys, because I believe the median income in the country is something around like $78,000 a year. So very far away from that number. And of course, that's just the median. If you want to buy an expensive area like this, or not even like this, you can look at places like Seattle, for example, you need to have household income $193,000 a year. If you want to buy in LA, you need to earn $192,000 a year. Even in Denver, Colorado now, you need to have a household income of $161,000 per year, which is kind of unattainable for many different households, unfortunately. And I can see when people hear stuff like this, why they think that, you know, these uh, 
phrases that we're hearing of you'll own nothing and be happy might be coming true because at those levels of income, most people can't afford to buy. But look at how low home sales are now. Look at how low mortgage applications are now. And these figures that we're talking about here are proof that that's not going to last because people can't afford it, guys. And the less people that can afford a home, the less drive there is for the housing market. There's not gonna be the demand to buy a house. Now, of course, the demand is always secretly there. People do want to buy, there's the desire to buy, but they won't have the income to, and therefore can't. And that's what I mean when we're talking about demand. It's not just the housing market that's in trouble, but really our entire economy, if you ask me. Because every single week, we see different stories of companies that are downsizing, performing layoffs, whatever, trying to cut back on expenses. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. Number one, demand for a lot of different goods and services is down right now compared to a year, two years ago. But also, a lot of companies are scrambling, trying to figure out what, they're, what they need to do financially to stay afloat because of the high interest rates, guys. And corporations haven't really felt the impact of high interest rates just yet because many of these corporations still have a lot of low interest rate debt, but it needs to be refinanced in the next coming year or two. And so basically, a lot of companies are facing what you would call a financial cliff that they're gonna fall off of if they don't get things in order sooner than later. And you can look at UPS as a good example of that. UPS is offering early retirement. Right now they're offering 167 pilots to voluntarily uh, retire from the company, which include cash and healthcare benefits. And they have about 3,400 pilots right now. So that's not a huge chunk of their current staff, but that shows you that they are not doing so well and need to do something to get people out and stop paying these salaries. Earlier in August, the company cut its full year revenue and profitability targets and they cited softening package volume as one of the reasons, higher labor costs and business losses resulting from a tumultuous but now completed contract talks because they have a union. So between all of these things, UPS needs to figure out how to cut back on expenses and so many other companies are doing that right now. How some other companies are figuring this out and how other ones are trying to make up the difference. You have companies like Visa and MasterCard, the credit card companies that are gonna be raising their fees on all the merchants, okay? And this is gonna have a huge impact potentially on inflation and how much things cost. Because one thing you gotta remember is when you pay with a credit card, the merchant that you're buying from pays the credit card fee in most cases. Now there's some places you can go to a local store and sometimes they'll charge you a fee to use a credit card and it's to pay for the fees that they're being charged for you to use it. And this is gonna have such a significant impact that this increase could cost an estimated $502 million a year in extra fees to merchants across the country. And to give you an idea of how much they're collecting in fees, last year, merchants across the US paid about $93 billion to Visa and MasterCard just last year, okay? That number was 33 billion in 2012. So these guys have tripled their revenue that they're collecting from merchants in just about the span of 12 years, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. So the reality is everything is costing more, guys. Inflation is hitting everything. And I don't know if this increase that they're gonna be, that Visa and MasterCard are gonna be charging in extra fees is justified and warranted or not. It could just be greedflation. And we've covered this term on the channel before. And basically what that is, it's when different companies just start charging more for their goods or services, even if they don't need to, just to capitalize on the current high inflation environment because consumers are getting accustomed to paying more for everything. And so they just charge more, even though they don't need to. And that in turn makes inflation even worse. And it's gonna take us longer to get out of this inflation ordeal. So that is a real thing that's happening right now. And think about this. 
if merchants are being charged more for everything, maybe they won't pass along the credit card fee to you like some merchants do, but maybe what they will do is raise the cost of all their goods and services to make up for it, okay? So one way or another, you and I are gonna pay for this, whether it's directly or whether it's through a higher cost of things that we wanna buy with a credit card. And yeah, some places might give you an incentive to pay with cash or a debit card in order to avoid these fees. But in reality, people are used to using the credit card, even me, I'm guilty of it. I use the credit card for everything because you get the points, you get the benefit of using that credit card as long as you pay off the bill every single month. But now I'm wondering how much longer that's gonna last with this current situation. Now the government is trying to eliminate some of these credit card fees, believe it or not, through the Credit Card Competition Act. And what they're trying to do is allow merchants to process Visa and MasterCard payments over alternative networks, which arguably would provide lower fees and essentially more competition. So they'll have another way to charge people and not have to pay whatever Visa and MasterCard feel like charging at the moment. I'm not sure how much something like that would work. I know having competition in any sort of business is good for lowering prices. So maybe it would have some sort of an effect, but you know how things go with the government. This could take years before this is even introduced, or maybe it won't even go through and it will never get introduced. So that could be part of it as well. Now here's the next thing. I told you this is gonna be random. Montana is starting to see an uptick in homeless, okay? And the reason I'm bringing that up is because I'm walking in the state right now that has the most homeless people in the entire country. But a lot of people like to pick on California for this. But in reality, there's like some more things at play here that are kind of out of California's control. And I'm not sticking up for them and saying they're doing a good job with the homeless issue. But I want to bring this up because it's something interesting. Missoula, if I'm saying that right, Montana, has a homeless population of about 600 people and it's getting to the point where people are now camping out in tents in different parks across the area and it's becoming disgusting just like it is here in different areas where they allow that to happen and so now montana's parks are facing the same problems that you see on the streets of la and san francisco okay you have a lot of trash building up in different areas starting to have human feces all over the place and you know, it's to the point where they're poisoning the local river because these parks all run next to the river over there. And it's a problem, guys. And here's the issue. Missoula has a law against camping in a park, but they can't enforce it because in 2018, the ruling by the 9th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals prevents officials from removing anyone from camping in a public space in its western U.S. jurisdiction unless there is a shelter to move them to. And so like I was saying earlier, it's not just Montana or California that faces these issues. This is a western U.S. problem for the most part because of this circuit court having this jurisdiction and making this ridiculous law and even According to this report, the governor of California is not even happy with that. Gavin Newsom here says that this law is preposterous and inhumane, that they're not able to move people around like that. And I think so as well, guys, because, you know, to let just people camp out on the streets and let everything deteriorate into a hellhole, essentially, is ridiculous. And I don't understand why they would make this decision but I don't see the problem with moving people around to a more vacated area, at least, or something that's not in downtown, that's you know super visible by all the tourists, scaring everybody away, making it dirty, making it disgusting, and making it undesirable for people to visit and spend money. And now you have businesses closing shop and everything because of this issue. And it's all because of this ridiculous law that they passed in 2018. So until this gets reversed, you know, Places across the Western United States are gonna to continue to have problems with homeless and a place that you would never expect that this is gonna happen, like in Montana, for example, because so many people you know, blame it on politics that it's happening, right? Well, Montana, let's just say, has different politics than California, okay? But now they are seeing an uptick in this homeless problem that they can't do anything about. For anybody who saw my video from yesterday, that's actually the neighborhood right down there where Robin Williams used to live. 
and uh, we walk through there. So if you missed that video, check it out. And on this side, you got that neighborhood. And then from here, you can see San Quentin State Prison from here. So wave to all the prisoners with the Bay View. <laughs> now in Missoula, in Montana, people are claiming that the reason they're becoming homeless is because they're being priced out, okay? They can't afford a place to live anymore. The cost of a rental, a one bedroom rental in Missoula is now almost $1,200 a month, which is up 50% from 2019. So sounds like the same thing happened in Missoula that happened in many other places across the country where the cost of living absolutely skyrocketed and now people can't afford it. Now, that could be the case considering they only have 600 homeless people, but you, al you always know that there's a good chunk of it that's related to drugs, alcohol, mental illness, different problems with that as well. So to say that it's all just related to the cost of living is definitely not true because in many cases here in California, they offer people a place to live and they flat out refuse it because they don't want to get off the streets because you have to you know, get clean essentially to live in one of the shelters and they don't want it. And now it's to the point where Missoula has 60 homeless encampments across the city, guys. So that's pretty bad. I mean, we don't even have that in, in Miami where we live, thank God. But, um, you know, it sounds like this is coming everywhere, especially in the western part of the United States. And hopefully the eastern half of the United States doesn't follow this ridiculous decision Hopefully this actually gets repealed at some point and they can start relocating people to more remote areas where the issue is not going to be as visible and people will have to decide to actually do something or, you know, live in the middle of nowhere. Now here's the next thing, circling back to Florida. The main provider of electricity is called FPL. So all my Florida people, you're familiar with FPL. We get the power bill from them every single month. And I just saw an email from them the other day that has a new incentive program for people that have an electric vehicle. And basically, here's what it is. They will install a level two charger in your home and do this at no upfront charge to you. And basically they give you unlimited nights and weekends for the charging of your electric car for one low monthly cost. So you can see the whole list of incentives they're giving you to do this, right? $38 a month, level two charger, charger installation and permitting, covered, no upfront cost for equipment installation, worry-free maintenance, we'll even maintain it for you, and so on and so forth. Now here's the first thing with this in order to qualify, okay, that kind of eliminates a lot of people from taking advantage of this, which I want to talk about. You have to own and live in a single family home or town home with an attached garage. So this already is a luxury for many people that can't afford this, guys. Even we don't live in a place like that in Miami because those places cost a fortune nowadays. You wanna live in a place like that, it's gonna be over a million dollars in many uh, nice areas for sure. There's also some more trouble with this as well, okay? The charge time on this, they say, is four to 12 times faster than a 120 volt charger of a level one charger, and it will charge the typical EV car in four to seven hours, which is still a very long time to charge the car. Also, it looks like there's also some caveats to this program where you can only charge the car during nights and weekends if you don't wanna pay extra. That's how you get this unlimited rate. Maybe if you charge outside of these time frame, then you will actually have to pay more in your electric bill on top of the $38 a month. But there's also a contract with this, right? Because there's no upfront cost. You think they're giving you all this stuff for free? No, they'll give it to you for free if you sign a five, 10 year contract, whatever it is, saying that you're gonna have this thing. And if for whatever reason you decide to cancel it, there's probably gonna be hefty cancellation fees, which conveniently weren't listed in this email. But here's the real big problem with all of it. You need to live in a single family home or a town home with a garage in order to take advantage of this. Well, if you've ever been to Miami, guys, there are condos and apartment buildings everywhere. Okay, that's where we live. That's where the large chunk of the majority of population that live in Miami live because first of all, it's a lot more affordable. And second of all, most of these areas are where the most desirable places to live are, you know, in the most densely uh, populated areas where things are walking distance, you know. So the majority of people in Miami live in some sort of condo 
or apartment, not a townhouse or a single family home. But here's the problem with this. They're only incentivizing people to get electric cars and get these uh, free charging stations and all of this that have the luxury of living in one of these properties. So if you don't, that means you can't take advantage of these programs, first of all. And the other part is, let's say buildings start doing this, like where I live or where you live in Miami. And um, they say, all right, you know what? We're gonna install 20 or even 30 of these chargers at the building so everybody with an electric car can start taking advantage of this. All right, cool. Except who's paying for the electricity, guys? Um, is this gonna go on the HOA fee? Uh, are people that don't have an electric car gonna have to pay for this as well? Like that starts coming up with all sorts of problems when you start getting into the nit nitty gritty of who pays for what when it comes to the HOA. Even if everybody had an electric car, let's say move 10 years into the future and you know they meet all of their goals with emissions and all of this and everybody has an electric car and we all live happily ever after, right? Well, even then, the building only has 30 chargers. It takes four to seven hours to charge one of these things in case you weren't paying attention. So you get home from work late and there's no chargers left in the building. What do you do then? You're gonna have to take it to one of the chargers somewhere else, fast charger, pay extra. Like this whole electric initiative to me is just not thought through very well, guys. And like I told you before, I'm not against electric cars. I'm just against the push for them and them to be the mainstream thing for all of us to have when we're not ready to have it yet. And this is a clear reminder that we're definitely not ready because the infrastructure is not there and I don't think it ever will be. Unless every single parking space in America has their own electric charging unit to charge the car overnight, I don't see this being feasible. And of course, we don't need that when it comes to gas stations because it only takes one or two minutes to fill up your entire car. So we don't need to have a gas pump for every single car in the country. You follow? So, but this is different. It takes a long time to charge one of these cars, as we just read. And these type of incentive programs are only open to the elite, essentially, right now, if you have the luxury of living in a single family home or a town home. Just something else to think about because I told you I was gonna give you a bunch of random stories today and I have a few more, but I'm just gonna quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> I'll save the next ones for a future video. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't wanna wait for my next one to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here and I'll see you in the next one.